with that, I would like to um, to welcome Dr. Tom Price to our our podium. Dr. Price um, was elected in 2002 to represent the state of Georgia after a really impressive career both in medicine and in politics. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and I always think orthopedic surgeons really understand the structure of things, and he's bringing his wonderful expertise in medicine and policy to understanding and really enlightening us all about, about the health reform debate. He's also the chairman of the Republican Republican Policy Committee, which is the largest task force in in the um, the largest caucus in the House, and bringing his his leadership skills there at a very crucial time. So, welcome, Dr. Price, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Grace Marie. Good afternoon. I think we're afternoon. Um, actually, an orthopedic surgeon's role in the United States House of Representatives is to break kneecaps. That's the role. And then to fix them so uh, we, we, we can break and, and fix. But I'm, uh, I'm uh, honored to be with you today and to share uh, a few words. And I want to thank the Galen Institute so very, very much for the work that they do. Grace Marie is always front and center on, on uh, uh, the common sense approach to health care and, uh, and, and the issues that confront us. As, uh, as she mentioned, I represent the 6th District of Georgia. I'm in my third term representing the 6th District, which is northern suburban Atlanta. It's Newt's old district, for those of you who are uh, political junkies. Uh, I'm a physician, third-generation physician. My dad and grandfather were, uh, were physicians. Um, and one of the things that, that drove me into public service was, in fact, the uh, sense after I got into private practice uh, that there were more folks in the state capitol and in uh, Washington that were affecting what I could do for and with my patients than anybody I ever met in medical school or residency. And I said, that just, uh, as we say down south, that just ain't fitting. Um, and, and so I got involved and began uh, lobbying at the state level and at the federal level, and one thing led to another, and I was privileged to serve four terms in the state senate in Georgia and now in my third term in, uh, in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, the issue of health care clearly is, um, is one that has been crying out uh, for reform and for change and improvement uh, for decades, uh, truly. Um, it's an important issue. It's one of those issues that will change your priorities in a split second. Many of you know that. If you've had a medical emergency, uh, certainly someone in your family has had a medical emergency, it will change your priorities that day. It will make you do things that you didn't think about uh, when you got up and hopped in the shower uh, uh, that morning. So it's important for every single uh, American. Uh, it's also imperative that we move forward and, and have appropriate reform and change because medical decisions are the most personal decisions, some of the most personal decisions that any of us will ever make for ourselves or our, for our family. So it's an incredibly important issue and the issues, the challenges and the questions that we face uh, are really very, very, very personal. Um, the third reason that we ought to address it, this one may shock some of you, uh, but that's because the solution is so simple. The solution is so simple. Now we struggle with how to get there, but the solution is very simple, and I would, I'll, uh, I'll share that with you, but you've got to stick around to the end to hear that. I want to share some other words with you before we get to that point. For, for each and every one of you who are obviously concerned about health care, now is not the time to be timid. Uh, now is not the time to be timid about what you believe ought occur uh, in, in the health care uh, arena. We are at that crossroads where we are going to make major changes uh, and we will move in, in one direction or another or another. Uh, and it's imperative that, uh, that those of you who are interested and, and knowledgeable about the issue uh, be actively involved uh, at this time. Uh, I would suggest to you that, uh, that the goal of those individuals who are currently in charge of the system here uh, is to increase governmental intervention in health care at some level. Some want a wholesale intervention, some just want kind of nibbling at the side, some want to modify things a little bit. But virtually every individual who is in charge of the political apparatus right now uh, is desirous of having us move uh, in the direction of some increased governmental control uh, of some aspect of health care. Each and everybody has their own kind of personal favorites of what the principles of health care ought to be. Most everybody includes the top three, which are access and, and affordability and quality. 
I suspect that's on your list. My list is five long, access, affordability, uh, quality, and then responsiveness and innovation. Two of the things that I believe have been unique to the American system of health care are responsiveness, that is that the system uh, has, when it works well, is responsive to patients, uh, and then innovation. We, are, we have uh, some of the greatest innovators in health care uh, have had in the world, and I think that we ought to have a system that, that in, continues to encourage that so that we can be responsive uh, to patients and, and uh, have the highest quality care. All of those issues... My five, I suspect your three, four, five, whatever, how long your list is, uh, virtually all of those issues are compromised by governmental intervention. So whether it's access or affordability or quality or responsiveness or innovation, I believe that they are compromised by governmental intervention. intervention. Let's talk about them just a little bit. Access. Most of you know that, that the folks who uh, are in a governmental health care system now, and there are four main ones, Medicare, Medicaid, the VA health system, and the Indian health care system. Uh, most of you know that access is, is limited in, the, in those systems. If you didn't believe it, you ought to know that the Mayo Clinic, one of the, the beacons of highest quality health care in this nation, the Mayo Clinic now limits the number of Medicare patients that it sees. You got that? The Mayo Clinic limits the number of Medicare patients that it sees. If you are a senior or you have a senior in your family, somebody becoming Medicare eligible, finding a new physician for a new Medicare patient is a real challenge. Access is compromised, I would suggest, because of governmental intervention. Affordability. The per person cost for health care in the governmental health care systems increase every year mostly at a, high, at a rate higher than in inflation every single year for, the, for decades. Uh, so affordability, the cost containment, does not occur in, in health care systems. When it does, then it compromises the other, uh, the other uh, uh, aspects or the other principles of health care. Uh, quality. Uh, for specific di diseases, I believe that we have the some of the highest quality uh, health care in the world, in the world. Um, I would suggest to you, however, that the vast majority of that is because of the remnants of non-governmental intervention and because of the altruism of the folks providing the care. Uh, no other industry service in, in the nation has individuals who say, sure, come on in, I'll, I'll provide the service for you, even though, even though I know as you walk through this door, uh, what I will be paid for providing that service will not even cover the cost of that service. Uh, that's a system that is relying on the altruism of those folks providing the care in order to, to remain uh, the highest quality. What about innovation and responsiveness? I don't have to talk too, too far about innovation and responsiveness and governmental intervention and hopefully get most of you to appreciate that, that one of the hallmarks of governmental uh, decision-making and intervention is not responsiveness and innovation. If you believe that, I'm happy to, to debate that with you uh, on the side. So clearly, clearly, increasing governmental intervention into the health care arena uh, is, is not the greatest idea. So why is it so popular? Why is it so popular? Why does anybody believe uh, that, that we ought to increase governmental intervention in, into health care? Well, I would suggest to you that there are uh, a couple, there are a lot of reasons, but I would suggest there are two. One is power. Uh, the, the politicians tend to like uh, to utilize the power that they have, uh, and, and, and one is indeed power. The second and probably foremost is ideology. Uh, there are uh, sincere individuals in this nation, there are sincere individuals who are uh, in, in the government right now uh, who believe sincerely that they and, and a system that they would put in place can make better decisions than individuals. I happen to believe that is fundamentally flawed at its very, very base. But they are sincere in their desire to, to uh, make decisions for individuals because they believe for a variety of reasons, whether folks can't make those decisions, they don't have the information to make those decisions, they could never be capable, on and on and on, you've, you've, you've heard all of the reasons. But it's a, it's a sincere ideo ideological belief uh, that they can make better decisions than the folks involved. Let me touch on three or four specific issues that will be part of this debate and that, and that you will hear some that you heard this morning. The first is, is mandates. Should we have uh, an, an individual or an employer mandate for the provision of health insurance? 
You know the lines, why you ought to have it. Everybody ought to have health insurance. In order to get everybody to have health insurance, you've got to mandate it. Uh, from, a, from the conservative side, I hear some of my conservative friends say, well, everybody's got to have, health, have car insurance, right? Yeah, got to have car insurance. So why, why shouldn't you have to have health insurance? And, and from a simplistic point of view, it makes, it, it makes some sense. But fundamentally, it is flawed for, for a couple specific reasons. The, the, one is that mandates forcing people to do anything probably ought to be looked at with, with, a, with a scant eye. You, know, you ought to look kind of, kind of sideways at, at, at forcing individuals to do anything, especially things that are so very personal. So very personal. But I would suggest to you that the main reason that we ought not have an individual or an employer mandate is because if you mandate something, then you've got to define what you're going to mandate. And what would be defined is the definition of health insurance. And as soon as you open up that, that Pandora's box of defining what the definition of health insurance is, then you're into the benefits package, and I promise you, what will not come out of that definition of health insurance is anything that relates to the responsiveness of the system that we currently have as flawed as it is. You will not have defined as health insurance something that has a high deductible catastrophic plan. It just won't be part of it. It won't be part of it because it will not be eligible for the definition uh, of health insurance. That's the main uh, reason why we ought not be mandating anything. Uh, second uh, issue that, that you'll hear a lot of talk about is quality. You've, you heard about the Comparative Effectiveness Research Council. Um, why ought we not um, embrace something like this? Well, you heard some of the examples from other nations. Uh, the NICE program, uh, a remarkable acronym in, in England, the NICE program is, is a prime example of why we ought not do the same thing. Uh, Billy Tozan, who is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the head of pharma now, has a, an incredibly personal story about his, how he is alive today utilizing a drug that the, that the English system, the NICE system, will not even allow to be eligible for knowledge to patients in England. They can't even know about the possibility of the use of the, of the drug that, that, that saved his life uh, with a certain cancer. To seed the definition of quality to non-medical individuals in a bureaucratic system is, is a death knell to quality health care. Is a death knell to quality health care. Um, and that's not because they're bad folks. It's because the bottom line for folks in a bureaucratic system at the federal level as it relates to health care is the bottom line. That's because that's their charge. Their charge is to make those, those numbers add up at the very uh, bottom of that page. Um, and if they can do it and provide quality health care for all, then that's a wonderful thing. But if they can't, the bottom line is the bottom line. Third, let me talk about a public option. Uh, one of the things that has gotten a lot of enthusiastic support uh, uh, already in, in Washington is to make certain that we've got a public option for folks to buy into. Shouldn't you have that? Shouldn't you have another uh, opportunity for folks to buy into a public health insurance program? Um, and it sounds great. It sounds grand. The problem is, as you well know, that whenever the, the, the government competes with the private sector, the government skews the game. Always. It can't do anything but. It's making the rules. It will define what has to occur. Uh, it will skew the system. It will be the, the next step in the line to a, a single-payer government-run system. If you believe that that's where you want to end up, then you'd probably support a public option. If you believe, however, that that is the wrong place to go, the last thing you want to do is to have a public option uh, for, uh, for that reason and the reason that patients will not be able to have that kind of responsiveness and innovation. The public system cannot have that. So what's the solution? I've talked about, ever since I got involved in public service, a patient-centered health care system. Patient-centered health care system. What's that mean? Uh, we can stay down in the weeds all day long and talk about health care, and, and most of you are, are more knowledgeable than I about, about those weeds. Uh, I'm fond of quoting President Eisenhower, who said, whenever he had a problem that he couldn't solve, he made the problem bigger. He made the problem bigger. And as soon as he got the problem big enough, then the solution came into focus. And I believe that's what we've got to do with health care. Once you make the problem big enough, then I think you can, one can find that the solution rests on two main pillars in order to have a patient-centered system. Now, the premise of a patient-centered system is that the system ought to move in the direction that patients want it to move, not, 
politicians or bureaucrats or anybody else. It ought to move in the direction that patients want it to move. So the two pillars of, of, of my solution are, one, everybody's got to have insurance. Everybody's got to have insurance. Uh, now, some of you who are of a conservative bent, as I am, when you start to think about that, that sentence and, and, you, and you think about it sincerely, you, you begin to get shaky a little bit. You say, now, wait a minute, what's he talking about? Everybody's got to have insurance. How do you do that without mandating it? You make it so that it is financially feasible, attractive, and foolish for anybody not to have health insurance. And you do that through the tax code, through a whole system, a hybrid system that I've strongly supported of, depending on where you are in the income bracket, Dedu tax deductions, tax credits, refundable tax credits, advanceable refundable tax credits, pooling mechanisms for the purchase of health, uh, health insurance, uh, tax equity for the purchase of health insurance so that individuals have the same kind of purchasing power uh, as businesses. Everybody's got to have insurance in order for the system to work. If we were to do that, I believe we would see the, the number of the uninsured tumble drastically because people will make wise decisions. If given the financial feasibility that it makes more sense when they sit down at night with their spouse and plan their budget to have health insurance as opposed to not to have health insurance, they'll get health insurance. Uh, people will, will, will vote with their pocketbook in the area of health insurance. So the first pillar is you've got to have health insurance. Second is that that insurance must be owned and controlled by patients. So you have a defined contribution system for the purchase of health insurance owned and controlled by, by patients. The model basically is the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. Uh, it's the only large system of health insurance that has held uh, inflation in, in health care to single digits for every year of the last 35 save one. Uh, it allows individuals to, to select an insurance policy and insurance companies to compete for their business based upon their personal situation uh, in, in life. Um, and that's the only way to make it so that the benefits package reflects what patients want. Right now, when a patient calls an insurance company and says, my doctor wants me to have this test and you won't allow it, what does the insurance company say? Call somebody who cares. Because I don't. Because you don't have any power. You don't have any power. If the patient owns and controls the health insurance policy, then that changes the whole relationship between insurance companies and patients. It means that they've got to be responsive, one of the principles, responsive uh, to patients. So everybody's got to have health insurance. You make it owned and controlled by patients, and the system of its own inertia moves in the direction that, that patients want it to move. Now is the time. We are at the crossroads in the area of, of health reform. I urge you, I challenge you, to increase your involvement. Some of you are involved from sunup to sundown. Sundown. It is time to increase that involvement. Recruit others to be involved in the process. Uh, we will see, I believe, before the end of the year, uh, uh, proposals that will be on the floor of the House and Senate that will fundamentally change our health care system. I believe... I'm the eternal optimist. I believe it can still move in the right direction, the patient-centered direction. But it will do so only when you and your friends and, uh, and your colleagues uh, engage. Uh, let me close with a quote from one of our founders, Samuel Adams, who said, It doesn't take a majority to prevail, but an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. Uh, I look forward to working with many of you and, and uh, set those brush fires of freedom in the minds of men and women all across this nation on the issue of health care, an important issue, one that is remarkably personal, and one whose solution is incredibly simple. Thank you ever so much. God bless you.